Welcome to Me Connect, and I'd like you to join me as I welcome Professor Howard Gardner to our program. Professor Gardner is Professor of Cognition and Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's gained worldwide acclaim for his theory on multiple intelligences. He's here in India and he's going to be touring. He's having seminars in five different cities of the country, all about public education. So do stay with us and keep listening. Thank you very much, Professor Gardner, for, for coming in. And I know you've just arrived in India. So let me start by saying this is your first visit here. That's right. Right? OK. Now, this multiple intelligences seems like a rather big word to the uninitiated. Love you to just explain it to me, please. Well, in almost every culture, there's a word that roughly is intelligence. Mm. And the implication is that uh, some people are smart, some people are average, some people are dumb. And as a first approximation, you can get away with that way of speaking. But actually, anybody who has spent time with other people, as a parent, as a teacher, as a worker, knows that people have quite varied sets of strengths and disabilities. Mm. So, you know, because somebody is good in learning languages doesn't mean they're good in finding their way around an unfamiliar terrain, mm. or that they have good understanding of how to mediate it a conflict or that they're a good baseball player right. or cricket player. And by the same token, if somebody is poor at learning foreign languages, you don't assume that therefore they won't be able to um, dance or that they won't be able to uh, solve a mathematical problem. So that intuition is uh, not, not strange. But over 30 years ago, I conducted a very wide-ranging and systematic analysis of all the information we had about human knowledge, human mm -hmm. cognition. And I had a whole set of criteria in my mind, and I proposed then that human beings, instead of having a single computer in here, have a half a dozen or a dozen separate computers, which I call the multiple intelligences. And the, the thrust of the theory is that strength in one intelligence or one computational capacity doesn't tell you about strength or weakness in any other right. computational yes. capacity. Mm -hmm. So I developed those ideas as a psychologist, and I thought that mostly psychologists would be interested in them because it's the theory of the mind. Right. Um, but in fact, uh, first the United States and then many other countries, it was really educators that found that the theory comported with their own experiences. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There are some students who are good at everything. There are some students who are poor at everything. But the more closely you look, all of us have kind of jagged profiles. And so the question is, should we say, well, that's the way it is and forget it? Should we say, well, that's the way it is and let's try to make everybody the same? Or do we say, well, that's the way it is and let's make the most of it? Right. And the education that I'm interested in is an education which recognizes the different intelligences and tries to use them to help people learn as well as they can. Right. Uh, but of course, um, now, this particular theory, you did say that it is being used and people are looking at it around the world. Have you had a chance to actually look at the different systems, the different education systems around the world in your own work and in your own experiences? I would say uh, you know, to, to a reasonable extent. Mm -hmm. In the year 2009, we published a book called Multiple Intelligences Around the World, and that had 42 scholars from 15 countries on five continents wow. write about their experiences. Mm -hmm. And these were people whom I typically knew personally and in many cases, I had visited them. Interestingly, there was nobody from India, and that's in part because this is my first trip. There were right. several people from China, because I've spent a lot of time mm. in China. There were people from Australia, people from all over Latin America, Europe, the United States. And so I guess what I'm saying is I have visited places where people are doing multiple intelligences work. I formed relationships with them, and those are, by and large, the people who wrote in, the, in that book. Right. So now on this visit to India, hopefully, you know, we will have people who will now begin to work with you on the way you're, you're talking about. But on this trip itself, you're going to be going around the country uh, talking about your theory and uh, maybe taking a look at the way the system is going here. Are you looking forward to that? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, one of the reasons for having the privilege of travel mm. is to not only learn, but to shake up your own understanding of things. <laughs> um, and yes. even though um, 
I guess I'm here on the MI or multiple intelligences ticket. I'm not particularly here to sell that perspective. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm not a proselytizer by nature. Mm. So I'm going to be in five cities talking about different issues, different uh, questions. And I'll be visiting schools and you know, being a tourist and sight, sightseer. And I would like to just take in some of the experiences of India, though there's an old joke in the United States. I don't know whether you have that joke here. It's that if you've been in India for a week, you can write a book. If you've been there for a year, you can write an article. Mm. And if you've been there for over a year, you don't write anything because it's much too <laughs> That's complicated. That's much too so complex. So having been here for two days, I could probably write several books. <laughs> it's, it's a very complicated and a complex yeah. country, uh, but a country of great potential, as, as you probably have read. Uh, now, uh, I was just wondering, uh, professional ethics, I did see that that's something that you have been looking at, and I loved that, actually. I'd want to draw you out on that. Well, I'm happy to do that, in part because one of the, one of the impetuses for studying ethics was what happened to my own theory of intelligence. In 1993, so almost 20 years yes. ago, I got a message from a colleague in Australia, whom I didn't know, mm. but the colleague said, your ideas are being used in Australia, and you're not going to like the way they're being used. Um, this was in the days when we had email, mm. but if there were attachments, I certainly didn't know how to download them. <laughs> so I said, mm. well, tell me. Mm. And this is like a flashbulb memory. The colleague sent me a pile of papers like this. Mm. And as I read through them, standing in my office at Harvard, the more I read, the less I liked. Mm. And when I saw a list of all the racial and ethnic groups in Australia, with which intelligences they had and which ones they lacked, I sort of threw up my hands and I said, this is nonsense, this is pseudoscience, it has no basis in reality. And then I held the mirror to myself and I said, should I ignore this or should I try to do something right. about it? And I had a kind of an existential moment where I said, if I don't take responsibility for my ideas, I can't expect anybody else to. And so by a, s a sequence of events, and because of work with other colleagues, I developed in the following year or two a project called the Good Work Project. And basically the Good Work Project is an attempt to understand how do workers come to behave ethically. And in my own case, the question is what's the ethical to, thing to do when somebody who's well-meaning uses my ideas but uses them in a way that I find repugnant. Right, yes. And in that particular case, I actually went on television in Australia I denounced this educational program and happily it was removed. Um, again, I don't question the motives of the people who did it. And indeed, let me bring up an Indian uh, example in this context. Uh, I would say over the last five years, I've had several dozens inquiries from India and once people heard I was coming, they came several a day. Mm -hmm. And one of the poignant inquiries is from people who look at fingerprints. Um, there's a whole field of looking at yes. fingerprints and I've been told both by other people and by the fingerprint people themselves that they can look at people's fingerprints and not only tell what intelligences they have, but also what their life prospects are. And with all due respect, the motivation may be good. I don't think there is a shred of evidence that this is true. And so a kind of a, uh, maybe a, a secondary motive here is to say, look, we have evidence that if you teach young people in ways that are individualized, and if you teach them in ways which are pluralized, and I can explain that, that it actually helps their learning. We have no evidence whatsoever that looking at your fingerprints tells you about uh, your intellectual right. profiles. This is getting very, very interesting, and I'm going to ask you, Professor Gartner, to hang on for just a moment. We'll take a very short break here and reconnect, and then we'll get right back with you. So please, don't go anywhere. <laughs> 